Hello, and welcome to the Freep Film Festival's panel to discuss Since I've Been Down. I'm Lily Altavina. I write about inequities in education at the Detroit Free Press. I'm here with director Gilda Shepard and Tanya Wilson, who you may recognize from the documentary. Tanya is also a re-entry outreach coordinator with the Freedom Project in Washington State. I want to thank you both for being here and congratulate you both for making this film. I, I'm hoping you can tell the audience a little bit about yourselves in your own words. Okay, age before beauty. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Lily, and thank you, Fripp Film Festival, for this. You know, Detroit is my hometown, so I was born and bred, and the artistic taste and vision comes from being reared in Detroit, Michigan. And I also want to thank um, the Detroit Free Press for bringing in an education reporter, journalist into this scene. And not only someone who deals with justice or criminal justice, sees the importance of education. And that's what Tanya and I and the rest of our team wanted this to be, a focusing on education. So I'm a professor of sociology, cultural and media studies at the Evergreen State College in Tacoma, Washington. In addition to being a, a filmmaker, you know, doing documentary now. And that's, you know, being a professor is when I first met uh, Tanya Wilson and my forays into um teaching for the last almost 20 years now, Ta, in prisons, the men and women prisons, teaching um, sociology classes and met some of the most amazing, brilliant, um, compassionate people that I've ever met. And some students who taught me a lot about the integrity of being, uh, being an educator and the responsibility of being a scholar and an activist. And so we put those things together and since I've been down our beautiful film, which we think is a love letter to children and their worlds and how we treat them and the possibility of the triumph of the human spirit in spite of a cultural punishment that sometimes is systemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's always systemic really. And as someone who is directly impacted by those systems that are, um, multi-layered, intersectional, and intentional about that oppression. I am a student of life, of trauma, of, of, of academics, but also of, of healing and restoration and community and finding that, that sense of having always been bright, having always been brilliant, having always been talented and being a part of a community and organizations and, and um, getting my own self in the mindset that um, when you have the space to heal, then you get to be that beautiful, brilliant, and talent, your, your talented self, it's not about changing, it's about healing. And that's one of the, the tenets of our uh, organization, Freedom Project. Awesome. Well, let's get to discussing the film. Gilda, early on, it raises a discussion about redlining, about schools, about systemic poverty. I'm wondering, how did you come to see all of these systems as intertwined? You know, what led you to that? Like I said, my background is in sociology, but I'm also, you know, I'm a feminist and, and a community organizer. I'm an organizer. And when I first came to the men's prison, that's when I started, I, um, I always introduced in my sociology classes this idea of sociological imagination. And that is looking at your biography, you know, who you are, your story in life, and how history and institutions impact not determined, impact your biography. And I usually get these great ideas, students you know, become so awakened, but the stories that came out of um, my first sociology classes were um, deep, impassionate, brilliant, scholarly, quoting scholars from all over the place and, and including the organic intellectual in their neighborhoods explaining some of the social emotional problems and and then also but also the policy of uh three strikes you know um 
uh, uh, not looking at brain science that, you know, one of the people in my classroom had been in prison since he was 13 years old in an adult prison. And to talk about the trauma informed in that, but also the some of the systemic things that led to that non-negotiable pathway to join gangs and those kinds of things. I was like, well, I thought I'm supposed to bring in these questions so that you could find out. And then I realized there was a group called the Black Prisoners Caucus. And they were a 40 year organization over 40 years now that have been doing all kinds of education classes, prison initiated classes within prison that was particularly among black men, but spread throughout the different um, 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 ethnic and racial groups. Then I went to women's prison. And I found a village and I had Gilda, you frozen, honey. Oh, you, well, did I cut out just a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Just I, I bet you I look funny when I freeze. <laughs> no, you actually use it, but we can look great. It's okay. We can pick up kind of where you were, which you were talking about how you discovered Teach and the Black Caucus. Right. Yeah. The the black you, you, were, you say, yeah, you were black going black. into the women's prison and. Yeah. Okay. And soon I went to the women's prison and I re-met my brilliant student, Tanya Wilson, who was a student of mine at the Evergreen State College in a bridge program, right? And I remember she was brilliant. And so, so well read and da, 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 da. She would, you know, enlighten the classroom. Then I didn't see her anymore. Then I was at the women's prison doing some kind of something. And there she was. And I was like, mass incarceration. I'll be doggone got her and she's brilliant? What the heck? So it made me look at the stereotypes I have about people who go to prison too, right? But I also realized that this prison, the women's prison, which was one of the most violent prisons in Washington state, when Tanya and her colleagues started a group called the Women's Village, violence went down by 50%. Not only did they deal with that violence and not, you know, and, and communication and language, but they also did uh, courses for the, the women to get their GED. They did peer counseling. That's what these women took upon themselves, right, to do. So I'm like, ah, you know, um, the answer to a lot of our problems, maybe we could consult the folks that we have thrown away because they get it. You know, and it started because I had been doing this work in this refugee camp in Ghana, West Africa, and I was leaving, and the woman said, you know, this guild of the same AK-47s that you see in the Civil War in Liberia are on your street and in your children's hands. And that's how from Evergreen I started working in the prisons, started, and then finding out this triumph of the human spirit. And so I wanted and they talked about gentrification. They talked about how that this is a Mississippi River, but the tributaries is a gentrification, redlining, um, this, you know, the white supremacy in schools, right? The curriculum, um, all kinds of social emotional things. What happens when, when their parents come home from a war, right? And how that impacts. And so I, I, I looked at all these systems and I saw things anew. And I saw it coming from the subject, not from us coming in, you know, with our PhDs. You know, I opened a curtain to a stage that's already set. And I thought that, you know, this love letter to children and their worlds needs to be communicated to their worlds and other children. So we can look at these systemic problems and birth, you know, since I've been down, right? It doesn't praise prison. It talks about these um, triumphs in spite of the cultural punishment. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah. I'm interested, I'm interested Gilda, in Gilda at least gentrification. And you talked about that in the film about returning to Tacoma after 17 years, yeah. seeing how much it changed. It, it, how, how have you seen that impact Black community members and impact people just coming back from prison, you know, like yourself? I think there was a sense for me, myself, I'll go backwards. Um, there was a sense of uh, amazement 
because like I said, the trees were beautiful. They made the they made the streets that were familiar. They look august and disand, but the people weren't the same. And so while the, while they looked familiar and beautiful, they were also strange and um, not as welcoming. There was a certain flavor and texture to life on the hilltop that has definitely changed. And it's not that it's for the worse or for the better. It's it's for the comfort of somebody that that isn't like me, you know? And so that that brings a sense of mourning into um into my experience of of, of coming back to where I'm from. And um, you know, for the greater community, I think that we have recognized it. I think that organizations, people who live there, um you know, community action groups, they recognize it and, and they want to mitigate the the change. I, I don't think that people necessarily want to turn back the tables because I don't think that's a, a realistic thing to want. But then there are other people who blame the people who 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 lost their homes and their children for the uh, uptick in drugs and the uptick in gangs. And I just keep saying that, you know, these things are imported. These are, these are gangs and, and, and drug, uh, like the crack epidemic is not a domestic, I mean, you know, it's not a domestic export. It's a import from some other place and designed directly to uh, break up strong and stable uh ways of being in communities that seem um, either desirable or uh, threatening. And so really, when you think about it, if it's, if a, if a community looks desirable, then we, then we break its back. If a community looks threatening, then we break its back. And then it's like a, a snake eating its own tail. Um, and so, you know, I, joyfully enter all of the community events that happen, knowing that the work that needs to be done here um, is not just uh, one in the hearts of the minds of the people who have come in to the, into the community, but also that those who have grown up in the community and who have a, a, an internalized sense of oppression. Hmm. Yeah. It, it, because, you know, there, is a, there was a, a strong, with gentrification before that, you know, policing happens in communities. Right. And so, and when there's a disinvestment in education, housing, and employment, you know, it's just like one of the people are saying in the film, that becomes a, a scaffold but for um, other kinds of behavior, what we consider deviant. I dare say the disinvestment in communities is also the most deviant and you could see how rents had gone up high and and all of a sudden policing came in washington state was the first to uh initiate three strikes you're out right you know and so all of these punishment policies came in dancing with gentrification yeah well, and I'm curious from both of you, it, we know that the pandemic has just worsened a lot of inequities in society. And I'm wondering, you know, how specifically has it impacted people who are incarcerated and, you know, people trying to build programs like TEACH? How has it changed what you do, Tanya, when you're working with people in reentry? Well, it it uh, has created uh, like just a, a stop flow of communication between and support between the people who are on the inside and those of us who are out here waiting for them. Uh, we can't go in uh, to the prisons anymore. And what's so ironic about that is that when the pandemic hit, there was no COVID in prisons. So the people who brought it in, even no, there was no visiting. There were no programs. So the only people who came into prison were the people who worked there. And so it became a, a, a pandemic of punishment because the people who, 
who work in the prisons would bring it into with them and then infect the population. And then they were then further punished because of their, because of their infections. And so no programming. Um, I mean, very little religious programming, no visits, no, um, no, nothing. And then as you get out there, there's a sense of not having been prepared as well as you could be because of those limitations. Hmm. Yeah, so culture shock a lot of times. Yeah. And in some prisons, that it's, it's worse than other prisons. I think in Washington State, there's about a little over 300 cases, right, of it. Of, um, um, it has, um, and the lack of programming, you know, and how um, the people have to stay in their cells in the culture of uh, solitary confinement. That is, you have to stay in your cell in this small cell for that long. And then there's some uh, people who say, well, they, you know, they deserve to be punished. All right, unfortunately, we, we, we lost Gilda, but we still have Tanya here. And I just have one final question that Gilda has answered. Uh, Tanya will uh, read it, and Tanya will also have her own answer for it. And that is, what do you want audiences to take away from the film? So why don't you start by reading Gilda's answer? Yeah, thanks, Lily. Um, Gilda said that we have a culture of punishment that does not work. Healing as... Tanya said, is pivotal, and we have a chance with children for that healing. The importance of not only investment in communities, but families, public health concerns, and seamlessly integrating into academics, K through 13, and higher education. I think she meant 12. And really building on policies that reflect the thriving and um, rest restorative processes of brain science as well as Gilda has, uh, I think she is alluding to the fact that so many children were thrown away in the 90s and, and 80s and 90s. And now we know through the, that record breaking um, uh, judgment that you can't just throw away kids and give them life without or put them on death row. Um, and, you know, who would have thought that that kind of justice would come out of the scientific community? And so. And Tanya, what's your own answer? What do you want people to take away from, you know, what you said and, and, and how you're featured in the film? I think about the things that we dig our heels in onto our political ideologies, social, religious ideologies, the things where we wholly believe one thing and discount anything redeeming about the other thing. And I think that it's really important, it, at least it has been for me, um, to integrate curiosity and kindness in a way that it becomes a part of your daily life. If you can think about being curious about other people and being kind to them, your family, you would know that um, that there are times when somebody makes a mistake and you are willing to ask how did how did it happen and to forgive them of that mistake. And while and while people are looking at this film, they need to look at the men and women in there as their sisters and brothers, their aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, friends, mothers and fathers, so that they can be curious about what kind of policies brought them there, what kind of lives, and then to offer a little bit of kindness in that, a little bit of grace, because in that space, that there's a sacred space in between curiosity and kindness that becomes a kind of bravery, the willingness to look into the face of something that may not be, uh, that may be fearful or not palatable and still love it on the level that you would do so for your own family. And so I would just say that hopefully audiences will take away uh, a sense of curiosity and kindness as they watch this film. Well, that's an excellent note to end on. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Gilda. 
Thank you for being a part of the festival. Thank you for making this film. We very much appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to our viewers for watching. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Free, free and Free Press.